Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. It is great to see you all tonight, and I just want to say what an honor and privilege it is to uh, be in Wilson, North Carolina tonight, and to uh, have had the opportunity to share in this time with you. I, I told Joel earlier when I saw him, it was certainly a pleasure to be able to put a face with a voice, because I think it was probably about, I don't know, two or three months ago when uh, Joel and I got on the phone together one night, and uh, next thing I know, we had been on the phone probably about an hour and a half uh, mm -hmm. together, just talking about life and talking about issues and talking about things that were going on in our in our nation and in our world. So, I really counted a privilege uh, to have the invitation to come and, and share with you this evening. And what I want to do is just sort of give you a little bit of a, a background. We've got a bio that was handed out there uh, by John Kay, who's helping us with our campaign and. You can simply read the bio and it tells you a little bit more about my background, but I want to tell you a little bit about the journey of how I got here because the, the obvious question I oftentimes get is, um, you're the pastor of the First Baptist Church of Charlotte, and the answer is yes, and you've been a pastor for 24 and a half years, uh, and the answer to that is yes, and then the question is, what in the world uh, are you doing uh, stepping in to something like this? And so I want to give you a little bit of the background. My, my journey in and of itself is a, a pretty interesting journey, at least to me. I was born in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. I'm a native of, of this great state. I uh, grew up there in Winston-Salem, and uh, my mom was a kindergarten teacher, and my dad uh, worked in production planning at Container Corporation of America uh, as a supervisor of production planning uh, where they made corrugated boxes. And so I graduated from high school in Winston, and headed to uh, college at Appalachian State University. It's there that I met my wife, Beth, and uh, we fell, fell in love. And uh, Actually, it was at that time, while I was uh, there it, at Appalachian State, I made a decision to go to law school because I sort of had a very interesting aspect in my life that had developed, and that was quite an interest in public policy. In fact, when I was only uh, eight years old, I was fascinated by the Watergate hearings as I watched them on television, and uh, Senator Sam Irvin, who was asking those questions was from North Carolina. And I remember at age 14 being dropped off at the Americans for Reagan office a few days a week by my parents that was on Healy Drive in Winston-Salem. And as I see the young people here tonight, uh, I just encourage you to get involved because even as a 14-year-old, stuffing envelopes and making phone calls left a real impression in my life. And as a result of that, actually, I had the privilege of going to the inauguration in January of 81 of President Ronald Reagan. And that was uh, definitely affected my life. As a junior in high school, I was invited to go to Boy State and represent my school at Boy State, which was a program held on the campus of Wake Forest University, put on by the American Legion, and was fortunate enough during that time to be selected to go and elected to go to Boys Nation, which was three weeks later at American University, where each state, each boy state, elected uh, two individuals to go and to uh, represent their state. And so I had that privilege of being able to do that and to share in that experience of learning about the federal government at American University, just like Boy State had focused on state government. And so by the time I got back from there, I really had the bug. And so I went to Appalachian State, majored in political science. All public policy makers, it seemed, had to go to law school. And so I applied to law school. I was accepted in my senior year uh, at, uh, to go to Campbell University School of Law. And Beth and I were getting married in June when we finished school. And then I was going to start law school in August. And she was going to teach school in Lillington, North Carolina. And two weeks before my wedding, and two months before I was to start law school, God called me to preach. And, and I, I never looked back. Now, I've been a pastor, quite frankly, who has not been afraid to speak out on issues. And to, because I really believe, Ronald Reagan himself said, that the Bible contains all the answers to human civilization if we're just willing to look at it. And that's true, and I've always believed that. And so um, I've never been afraid as a pastor through these 24 and a half years to speak out on issues and lead our congregation on issues. Many times I've stood on the streets of Winston-Salem when I pastored in Clemens holding the sign to support the unborn child in something called Life Chain. We were part of March for Life uh, in Washington, D.C., along with Dr. James Dobson's call for us to come. So uh, I've always been involved in that. My wife being a board member of the Pregnancy Center locally there. And it's been an issue that has been a big part of our lives, as has the marriage issue. As you know, when the marriage amendment came to North Carolina, 
Um, I took a major leadership role in that uh, as one of the founding members of the Vote for Marriage NC campaign and worked alongside many others in seeing the marriage amendment become a part of our North Carolina Constitution. So those issues have been important to me in this journey. But one thing that was interesting to me, even as a young boy, that really and truly captivated my heart and has brought me to the point of stepping into this race is while I was at 14 years of age and working with the Americans for Reagan <coughs> office, it was one thing that I soaked up particularly about Ronald Reagan's governing philosophy. And that is he compared American politics in this nation to really the building of a three-legged stool. That you have to have a strong domestic agenda, that you have to have a strong foreign policy, and that you have to have strong traditional values. And if any one of those three legs was weakened, or if one of those three legs is broken off, that stool is not going to be able to stand. And I just commit to you as I've entered this race in these recent days that to, for the United States Senate, that as a candidate and then hopefully as a United States Senator from North Carolina, those governing principles of those three, that three-legged stool, I just want you to know is embedded in my mind and embedded in my heart and would be what would be a very important aspect to me in, in serving in the United States Senate. You see, under that strong domestic agenda, I think there's no question that we need to recognize the importance of our Constitution. We need to recognize that it was given to us by our founding fathers and we have a tremendous legacy in that. We have freedoms that, we are, that are protected for us in there. I wholeheartedly believe in that freedom of being able to speak freely, the freedom to worship God as you please. And yes, the freedom for Americans to be able to own a gun without the concern that the American government is going to come in and somehow take that away from us. Those freedoms have got to be protected. And they are by our Constitution. And we need leadership that will understand those principles. I also understand that we've got to do something in this nation to begin to shrink the size of government. All of us in this room, I think, understand that our government is too large, it taxes too much, it wastes too much of our money, and it has infringed far too much into our daily lives. And, and frankly, Americans are fed up with that. And we're wanting to recognize that we need to shrink the size of government as we live. And we need leaders that are going to do just that. Also in the side, if you stop and think about that domestic agenda, we've got to be willing to recognize just what we have in front of us and the crisis that is facing our nation today called Obamacare. And I mean it is a crisis. And a priority of mine, number one, will be to step in to repeal Obamacare. And I'm thankful that if we elect a United States Senator who is a Republican from North Carolina, we will be one vote closer after November of 2014 in replacing Jay Hagan, one vote closer to repealing this disastrous piece of legislation. We don't need the government telling us how to operate our health care. And that's critical for where we are in our day. So that's going to be a priority within this domestic agenda. In fact, I'm concerned because I don't think most of the American people understand the challenge that we have in front of us. There's a few people who do. We watched the other Tuesday night. I spoke at a group in Guilford County a week ago this past Tuesday, and had just gotten word during the day that Ted Cruz had stepped onto the floor of the Senate and was beginning that filibuster. And when I stood up that night at the Guilford County uh, for cons uh, the Conservatives for Guilford County meeting, I said, I will tell you this as we begin this night. I want you to understand that ever since I have been feeling led to get in this race, there have been three words that I wanted to mark this, my candidacy in this race and my time in the United States Senate. And that is character, and that is consistency, and that is courage. And whether you agree with this tactic or disagree, I am thankful for men like Ted Cruz who are the epitome of character, consistency, and courage in standing up for what he believed and standing up to stop Obamacare. People like Ted Cruz get it. And I'm very grateful that he gave the advice to the a week ago this past Sunday to the United States House of Representatives that if Harry Reid and this president 
continue to stonewall and continue to say as you pass bills over to the Senate that we won't even consider them, then you take it apart and begin to vote on appropriations bills one by one to fund each department of the federal government. And that's exactly what they're doing. Don't let anybody tell you that this government shutdown is to be laid at the feet of Republicans. This is to be laid at the feet of one Barack Obama and one Harry Reid. And that is where the blame that we find today needs to be placed. Because it's real. And where is the junior senator from North Carolina in crying out to the leader of her party and crying out to the president who is in her party for the damage that is being done and for what we are facing in this day. I'm very grateful for folks like Ted Cruz who understand the importance of character, consistency, and courage. And it would be my hope that in the United States Senate that that's exactly as I was asked earlier today on the radio, what would you be doing if you were in Washington right now? I said, in my heart, I believe that I would be standing with those handful of people who really do get it and understand just how disastrous this legislation is and will be to this nation. I mean, do you understand even the Congressional Budget Office has estimated that by 2023, just 10 years from now, 10 years goes by like that, then 10 years from now that we will be spending $3 trillion on health care. $3 trillion. Now to put that in perspective, all federal spending today comes in at around $3.5 trillion. So within just 10 years, on the course that we have now been set on as of Tuesday, we are headed for that kind of disaster. We need people who understand just how disastrous this can be to our nation and step forward to repeal it. So we need a strong domestic agenda that understands those kind of issues. We need a strong foreign policy. <coughs> Listen, you and I have stood and watched over the last five years as this president has single-handedly, and I mean almost single-handedly because he's had Democrats in Congress who have watched, who has devastated the reputation of this nation to our allies, who has devastated this, the reputation of this country on the world stage. And we have stepped by and watched. This president has adopted a philosophy that we've been told is, quote, lead from behind. When the reality is he has simply failed to lead, period. And as he has failed to lead, you've had a Congress, Democrats particularly, who have watched this go on. And I commit to you tonight that I will not sit by and watch our nation's reputation denigrated on the world stage. No, I believe in a strong military. We need a strong military in this nation that really and truly will, will be enable us to have the respect. It was that strength through peace, or, or peace through strength, I should say, that made the biggest difference in our nation. And we need to understand that kind of philosophy again. We need to take care of our military. We need to take those that are in harm's way as well as those that are here at home and make sure that they have the resources that they need in order to protect us as a nation. You see, it's when we have that strong foreign policy that we can really begin to understand the responsibility that we have to still be that shining city on the hill. That is a responsibility and it's a part of who we are as a nation. But then when you take that strong domestic agenda and you take a strong foreign policy and then you recognize that we also must have strong traditional values that's the third leg that's why that as you know I've, I've spent a lot of my life standing very clearly on those issues that's why I recognize faith and family is so critical in this day and then we've got to be aware of a government that seeks to continue to restrict our religious freedoms. We've watched it happen. I've been one of 1,500 pastors in this country that stood on Pulpit Freedom Sunday in 2012 and stood strong to be able to declare that no longer are we going to have the IRS or the federal government trying to put a cloud over our pulpits to tell us what we can preach and what we can't preach. We can no longer stand that. 
Due to the Johnson Amendment passed July 2nd, 1954, we have found a cloud placed over the pulpits of our nation. And when you look at what has happened in this country since that period of time, as Dr. Phil would say, how's that working out for you? It's not working out very well at all because that cloud continues to hang over the pulpits of our nation. And we need folks of courage that are willing to stand and understand we cannot have those religious liberties and those religious freedoms restricted. That's why I find myself standing firmly, firmly opposed to abortion. That's why I find myself standing firmly believing that marriage is between a man and a woman only. And have spent time, tears, sweat, and blood seeking to make sure that that occurred in our state in 2012. You see, a strong domestic agenda, a strong foreign policy, and strong traditional values is what we need to focus on again from our leaders. But that brings us back to that key word, leaders. That's what's missing in Washington, D.C. You see, as all of us agree that strong domestic agenda, strong foreign policy, and traditional values that we say we believe in, we have a junior senator from North Carolina in Kay Hagan that does not believe that. She just doesn't. It's clear. We need to be reminded she voted for Obamacare. We need to be reminded that she has voted for the stimulus, that folks are still trying to figure out exactly what got stimulated besides our federal debt. We are living in a time where we must remind her that she has continued to vote for more increased gun control. She has continued to pass votes that would restrict our religious freedoms. No, we have got someone in Washington, D.C. today that is no longer representing North Carolina values sitting in that seat. And that must change. You see, people ask me oftentimes, they said, Mark, in fact, I was meeting with a guy in Raleigh not long ago, and he said, Mark, please tell me. He said, let me first of all say I admire what you're about to do. And I said, well, why do you say that, that you'd admire what I'm about to, to do? He said, well, here's the reason why. He said, first of all, Everybody loves a pastor. <laughs> I said, wait a minute. I immediately knew he was not a man of great perception when he said that. Or at least he wasn't Baptist. And uh, he said, everybody loves a pastor. I said, maybe, maybe what you mean is everybody respects a pastor. And he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I mean. Everybody respects a pastor. And he said, and yet you're about to step into an arena where 40% of the people in this state probably are going to hate you before you ever open your mouth. Because of your life, because of what you've stood for, they, they're, they're going to hate you. Mark, he said, you're going to deal with issues and no question you'll learn various issues and, and develop your own platform. But Mark, the real question you're going to have to answer is why? Why would anybody in their right mind step from that into this? Well, I'll be honest with you, when I left that Krispy Kreme donut shop in Raleigh where we were meeting and I headed back to Charlotte down 85, I just kept weighing over my mind time and time and time again. As I was making my way back to Charlotte, I got to where 85 and 40 split and I went, by, went down I-40 to Winston-Salem to go by and check on my dad. I lost my mom back last October, just a year ago this month, and and so I went by to see my dad, who's bedridden and has been for about the last seven, eight years. And I, I went in and I sat down as I was visiting with him. I said, Dad, I said, I got to talk to you about this decision I'm try, struggling to make. I said, this is the toughest decision, I think, that I've ever made in my life. My dad looked at me as only he could, 89 years old. And he said, well, son, let me just say this to you. Be careful. Be careful. I said, well, Dad, you got to understand something. If I do this, you will be a large part of the reason why. And he looked a little bit perplexed. And I said, you got to understand, Dad, the reason I say that 
is because you know whoever I talk to, I tell them you're my hero. Now you may be asking tonight, Mark, why is your dad your hero? Let me tell you why my dad's my hero and how that fits into this. My dad's my hero because at six years of age, his mom died with cancer. His dad was a drunk, couldn't take care of him. He dropped him off at an aunt's house at Ethel Hollingsworth in High Point, North Carolina. She quickly realized that she couldn't raise a six-year-old boy, and so she took him over to the Methodist Children's Home on Renola Road in Winston-Salem. That's where my daddy grew up in that orphanage. And he came out of that orphanage, and I'll be forever grateful to the United Methodist Church for raising my dad. And he came out not bitter, but better. He immediately went into World War II. He wanted to be a pilot, but they already had enough pilots, and so they made him a waste gunner on a B-17. And my dad sat in that position of a waste gunner on that B-17. They flew eight bombing raid missions, and my dad didn't have to fire one single shot from that uh, waste gunner position until November 2nd, 1944. They took off on the ninth bombing raid, and as they did, they were taking out oil reserves there in Europe, and they were headed back to the base when they came under enemy fire, his plane, which was called the 8-Ball, was hit and began to go down. All nine that were on that plane had to bail out. They were over Holland, which was actually under German occupation at the time. And my dad was immediately captured, taken to a German Nazi prison camp. And that's where he would spend the remaining months of the war. He was marched during that time over 700 miles in what was called the Death March in the spring of 1945. When my dad was liberated, along with the other survivors, he weighed less than 125 pounds. He came out of World War II, not bitter, but better. He met my mom and they fell in love. and They began to build a family together, a home together, and they built a life together. In fact, if my mom had lived until this past December, they would have been married 65 years. And I looked at my dad laying there in that bed that day, and I said, Dad, you know you're my hero. And I said, if I do this, you've got to understand why. I said, your generation, you looked at America from a different perspective than my generation. You looked at, at America from a 30,000-foot view. You understood that it's about everybody risking. And that's what you've taught me. It's about everybody sacrificing. And that's what you've taught me. And, and I said, Dad, you know, my generation, if we're honest, those of us in this room, we've been very poor stewards of that sacred trust that's been passed on to us. In, in our generation, we're very proud if, if we take care of our own. Not that taking care of your own is wrong. That's critically important. But the bottom line is, we've somehow lost the big picture view of our nation. And so we've got leaders in Washington today that are more concerned about their next election or more concerned about what pork barrel money they can bring home to assure their next election. They're more concerned about their political party than they are about God, than they are about country, than they are about anything. Our generation, our generation has been poor stewards. And that must change. And I said, Dad, you've got to understand, if I do this, a lot of it's because I believe you and your generation deserve better. And also, because I look at my three children, who are just about grown now. My daughter's a, in her fourth year of teaching. She's a teacher. Actually, third generation teacher. My wife was a teacher. My daughter's a teacher. My wife's mother was a teacher. Her dad was a teacher and coach and then superintendent of schools. Her aunt's a principal of school and at a school in Winston-Salem. Whole line of educators. And my daughter's in her fourth year teaching my second son. He's in law school at UNC Law and in his second year. And my youngest son is a senior at Wake Forest University and Lord Wendell will graduate next May in a business degree. But when I look at my dad, he deserves better than what our generation has done. And when I look at my children and my future grandchildren, they deserve better. 
than what we've been doing. You see, a lot of people talk about loving America. But I don't have to speak of my love for America in vague terms. When I look at my mom and my dad, and I look at the lives they lived, that's the America I know. That's the America I love. That's the North Carolina I grew up in. That's the North Carolina I know. And that's the North Carolina I love. And if I have the opportunity next November to defeat Kay Hagan and become your United States Senator, I commit to you that that's exactly what I want to bring to Washington, D.C. That three-legged stool, strong domestic agenda, strong foreign policy, and strong traditional values that have made America work. God bless you. Thank you for the opportunity to talk to you tonight. And I'll, be, and I'll be glad to entertain any questions, if you will, Joel. Yes, ma'am. You talk about um, your three-legged stool with a strong foreign policy. Yes. What's your standpoint if you point on Syria and the yes, right yes. direction that we should have gone? Did we go the right direction on that? What did we need to do? Well, to, to use the term right direction with this administration we currently have is, is very difficult to uh, work around. But let me, let me just describe it to you this way. When I talk about a strong foreign policy and how this president has failed to lead, Syria is a great example. When you have a strong military and you have then a strong policy, you know when and where to draw red lines. And you don't draw red lines that you're not prepared to back up. And you don't draw red lines in areas of the world and in circumstances that you don't need to be drawing. Because you are then in a much stronger position to be able to lead, not from behind. In fact, again, I go back to what I said earlier. This whole philosophy of leading from behind just led to the huge debacle that, that was Syria. And um, I'm, I'm frankly grateful that we didn't waste one single American missile firing in there at this particular time. It was not our fight. It's a civil war. And then, listen, when you've got a strong foreign policy and you know who your allies are and you know who your enemies are, then you're able to draw the proper red lines. What we've seen happening in Syria, what we had, saw happen in Egypt, and what we've seen happen in other places around that Middle East is we don't know who our enemies are and who our friends are with the exception of Israel. And when we see Israel uh, on the line, that's where we better be ready, ready to draw the red line and we better be ready to step up to the task. So that would be my management question. Right here, sir. Well, one of the major things I've seen is the breakdown of the family. You're talking about one of the major issues is the home aspect but so many families are being destroyed people have children and just they don't tend to their children and then the children grow up and have terrible terrible lives how do you solve the breakdown of the family i mean i, I know as you as a um if you do become a, a um, national representative that it would, it is a, would it be your issue or how would you solve that the breakdown of the family well, I think, I think you've got to have leaders that, that can espouse that vision and leaders that share that vision and leaders that can communicate that. I, I really, listen, believe me, I agree with you. The breakdown of the family is a vital part of why we find... Those traditional values, as I said a moment ago, they're what make America work. When you take those out of the picture, that three-legged stool can't stand. You know, we look at, at what has happened with the whole gun issue in this country. I mean, nobody's asking the right questions. When you look at Aurora, Colorado, you look at Newtown, Connecticut, and you look at what happened up at the shipyard, suddenly you've got Kay Hagan and Obama that are s suddenly wanting to make new gun laws. But what nobody's talking about is what every one of those mass killings had in common was they had a mental illness involved, they had violence through entertainment and the video games involved, and they had the breakdown of a family that was involved. 
We need to be talking about those issues that are at the real heart. We've had a real problem in our generation of asking the what questions. And we've allowed government officials to lead us down this path. We say, what's the problem? Well, here's the problem, so what are we going to do about it? That's the wrong question. The, wrong, the right question is, why do we have that problem in the first place? And begin to address that. But see, that's much more difficult to deal with. That, that steps on people's toes. That, that gets down to the nitty gritty. That's the kind of leadership that we've got to be voicing. And that's the kind of leadership we've got to have at all levels of government that are going to speak up once again. And so that, that would be what I would hope that we would be able to communicate. A great question. Thank you. Someone else right here. With all the educators in your family, yes. uh, tell me something about the conversation or what's going on in your family with the Common Core. Well, <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a lot of conversation going on about that. I think, bottom line, and, and this is just the direct answer to it, I'm absolutely against the federal government being able to be involved in the education system. If I had my way about it, there wouldn't be a federal department of education. I have learned through the years in my family, and I've got plenty of teachers in my family that understand that the closer education gets to home, the better off it is. Uh, the closer it gets to local control, the better off it is. And when you've got folks in Washington, D.C. trying to set some kind of national requirements for everybody, then you've got a problem in the area of education. And we really don't need them trying to tell us in North Carolina how to do education. So uh, that, that's a major, a major concern. And a while ago you were talking about some things that Kay Hagan did. I think she also sent um, Eric Holder a letter asking him to investigate the voter ID thing in North Carolina. Did she That not? led to his lawsuit? She may yes. very well have. It yes. led to his I'm lawsuit sure on that. that she did. Well, I, I don't know about you, but I think that is absolutely the silliest thing I have ever heard of. Why? Why there would be any, any pushback to having people simply show an ID to, to carry out one of the most precious, precious opportunities that we have as Americans and to protect the integrity of that by everyone showing an ID, I just, I don't understand it. I don't understand.